Hi everyone. Uh, I am Kumar Karthikeya Dwedi. Uh, I'm a first year PhD student at EPFL, and also like I've been contributing to BPF for like a couple of years now. So today I'm going to talk about uh, uh, exceptions in BPF. Uh, some of this is already upstream, and some of this is uh, something that I'll send out soon. So let's dive right in. So uh, this is the agenda. First, we begin with a very high level introduction and then an example, uh, some use cases that exceptions are meant to serve for now. And then we talk about the high level design and some of the future directions uh, this work could take. So what are exceptions? So they allow you to abort the execution of a program and return control back to the kernel. So if you know uh, Rust or C++, they are very similar to the panic or std terminate APIs that allow you to uh, immediately abort a program. Uh, you have a kfunk called BPF throw, which allows you to generate an exception, throw it from a program, and it takes a cookie parameter, which by default becomes the return value, but there's also a way for you to override the return value in case an exception is thrown. So this cookie is then passed to this special exception callback so once the program has completely aborted, there's an exception callback that will be invoked, and then you can decide what to uh, return at that point. But more importantly, uh, the verifier does not really follow a program path during verification once it encounters a VPF throw call. So we'll see uh, how we can use this to do really interesting things. So this is an example. Uh, we first, like on the top in bold, you see underscore underscore exception CV. So this is a way to define an exception callback for the program. So uh, we have a global function exception callback, which uh, we specify here. And inside the program, uh, there is a condition where uh, if it's not satisfied, we just call BPF throw. So in this case, we pass PC act short, which is like a, a, a way to drop the, uh, drop the packet. And then our exception callback will receive this cookie and it can decide what to actually return. So this is a way to basically tie the call side of the exception back to the exception callback. And like once this condition is not specified, the program aborts, it uh, returns control back to the kernel. So one of the first uh, motivating use cases of this thing was assertions. So uh, right now we have these macros, uh, BPF assert equal less than, greater than, less than equal, greater than equal, or range. So basically they allow you to update the verifier's knowledge about a scalar value. So this support is already inside the verifier. Whenever you take a branch inside the verifier, the verifier knows when it follows an execution path that this is the current value in this program path of this scalar variable. So what uh, what uh, this stuff does is for the other branch where the uh, condition is not met, it basically calls BPF throw. So in some sense, you're asserting that a specific value is true or a specific value is in a certain range at runtime. And if it is not satisfied, you just end the program uh, uh, immediately. So, and uh, the, the one of the other uh, advantages of relying on the verifier for this is that uh, whatever uh, improvements that come to the verifier's range analysis basically apply back to uh, uh, the way we expose assertions to the program. So once, if we can like compare ranges to ranges, like there was a recent patch, patch from Andre, so we can also assert that a variable lies within a range or something like that. So uh, a thousand feet view, uh, at every program point where we can possibly throw, that is, uh, if we see a BPF throw KFUN call, for all uh, frames in the call chain, like if you have multiple uh, function calls happening at that, uh, at that point, we basically have to generate frame descriptors, which basically describes the state of the program for each frame at that point. So uh, suppose if you have some resources allocated in the first main uh, subprog, and then you call a static subprog, so uh, whatever you have on the main subprog, this will be part of the frame descriptor information, and we'll see how it looks. And whenever we unwind all of these resources uh, that we want to release, when we abruptly uh, uh, end the execution of a program, we uh, want to know the information, this information so that we can release them at runtime. So if you have a, a socket that you have looked up and sp spilled the pointer on the stack, when we are basically unwinding your program stack, we want to release the reference to the socket before we return control back to the kernel. And in the end, the program is aborted, and uh, frame by frame, we keep on unwinding and releasing the resources. 
So in this case, like uh, say this is a, this is the main function of a program where it calls BPF object new, which allocates memory, and then you spill this pointer to the stack. So on the top right, you see the frame descriptor where the first part we don't really care about the uh, R10 minus eight, but R10 minus 16 we know that it's an uh, program it's a program allocated object. Now uh, suppose this calls a BPF function, and this one ends up doing a BPF SK lookup. Uh, which uh, again spills the pointer to the stack. Suppose you uh, suppose you do that. So in the frame descriptor for the frame one, you can see that you now have SK at F3 minus eight. And then if you call something else, uh, again, you uh, spill something to the stack. Again, that information is made part of the frame descriptor. Now what happens if you call BPF throw? So at runtime, since we'll have uh, all of these frame descriptors available to us, we can uh, start unwinding the stack uh, by first, uh, like for each frame, we figure out where the resources are located. And then uh, for every frame, we start uh, releasing them. So in this case, we'll do BPF rep count release. In, uh, in this case, we do BPF SK release. Uh, and in this case, we'll do BPF object drop. So just what the program would have done itself, uh, we do it for you through the BPF throw call. So uh, in case of resource cleanup for unwinding, we basically now uh, uh, have a frame descriptor for every call instruction. And then uh, before, uh, uh, before verification, we have to do a pass to uh, figure out all possible call chains that can throw. Uh, why do we do this? We'll get into in a minute. And uh, this frame descriptor information com comes directly from uh, whatever uh, state the verifier keeps track of. So whenever it is analyzing a program, it knows at what point, at what uh, place in the stack there is a resource. So we can just directly lift that information from the verifier itself. And then look this up using the program, the program counter at one time. So, so why do we need a pre-verification pass? So uh, if you don't know, there are two kinds of uh, subprogs in BPF. So you have a global subprog, then you have a static subprog. So in case of global subprog slash functions, the verifier basically uh, does their verification beforehand, before uh, starting the verification of the main program. This is basically used to reduce the verification burden. And also, global subprogs can be replaced at uh, runtime. So uh, uh, basically, uh, like whenever we have uh, a call chain like uh, the one on the screen, so suppose your main proc calls a static function, which calls a global function, which calls a static function, which calls BPF throw. Then during verification, like when uh, doing the simbex, the verifier sees global subprog, static subprog, and BPF throw, and then main uh, static subprog one and global subprog one. So basically, it never, uh, like if we don't know that global subprog eventually leads to a BPF throw call, we cannot really uh, know whether we have to generate frame descriptors from main and static subprog one. Sub -prog one. So basically, like uh, a pre-pass is needed to analyze all the call chains uh, and basically mark whichever subprog can possibly uh, uh, be reachable from a BPF throw call. This is similar to the BPF tail call reachable stuff we already do. So, uh, but we do need this to be able to actually generate the frame descriptors for main and static subprog one in case they call uh, global subprog one. So uh, this is something that also came up uh, like for the first uh, part that was merged. Uh, we were discussing whether we can allow people to uh, basically catch exceptions within a frame. So right now we have this catch all uh, callback. Uh, uh, when the complete unwinding of the program is done, we have this uh, callback that you can e execute to basically do something, uh, change the return value or do some action. But uh, sometimes you really uh, want to catch an ex exception being propagated uh, in the middle of your program, right? So uh, how do we, uh, how can we support this? So right now, like there's no, uh, uh, not a lot of users of this stuff. I've just been trying to uh, integrate into SCA DXT, but uh, uh, once we have more and more people, how can we go about doing something uh, using this? How can we go about doing something like this? So one of the uh, uh, one of the options is that uh, we lift compiler support and uh, basically have some way of uh, describing that uh, whenever you throw an exception, this is the landing pad that you want to execute, and the compiler basically uh, 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 puts some metadata along with alongside the program, and this can be passed to the verifier when loading. And when it uh, throws, uh, when it calls BPF throw, it starts basically simulating, uh, like unwinding the program, jumping to the landing pad and seeing whether we have to continue or stop. So, 
this would be one option, like uh, lifting the compiler support. Or the other option is like we imbue the verifier with constructor and destructor semantics, where we tell that for a specific object on the stack, this is the cleanup action that you have to do. It knows it beforehand. But there are different trade-offs with both because, like, if you have a catch block, you also have access to all the objects in the local scope of the frame. So uh, sometimes uh, that is much more uh, ben uh, like useful than uh, like having a function that does the cleanup because it lacks context. So uh, what next? Are assertions the only thing that uh, these uh, this primitive is good for? Uh, I would argue no because uh, uh, I've uh, recently understood that. This is like a much more fundamental primitive that can allow you to rethink how we do safety uh, property enforcement right now in the verifier. We have a lot of complexity for a lot of things uh, that we uh, implemented recently. And uh, something like uh, VPF exceptions would allow us to get rid of a lot of that complexity, as we'll see. Uh, this can be both fast and correct in terms of having no overhead at runtime and uh, still ensuring the basic safety properties that the verifier guarantees to the user. That is, the kernel will not crash, the kernel will not stall. Uh, so what if we could cancel a program? So right now, we talked about uh, whenever you have a BPF throw call, you generate these frame descriptors, right? But what if you could <clears throat> generate uh, frame descriptors regardless of whether a BPF throw call is made or not? Basically, like if a program is marked cancelable, if you could generate these frame descriptors, we pay some memory overhead, but the ability uh, that we get in return is uh, if you interrupt a program at some point, you could figure out how to basically abort it at this point if a BPF throw call was made. That's the whole point of the frame descriptor stuff. Basically, at any program counter, if we uh, see a program, if there's an interrupt and we see the program stuck at this point, we could, uh, we could know the state of the uh, stack of each frame, and we could steer the execution of the program to basically say a trampoline which calls, ends up calling BPF throw eventually using, by fixing the program counter. So why should we uh, have something like this? Like, why is it useful? So once we have uh, programs that can be canceled, we can act uh, actually do interesting things. Uh, so I'm going to cover a case which the verifier vehemently re reje rejects right now. So for example, loops. So right now we have this case where we have BPF iter, which, uh, 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 which basically guarantees that eventually uh, the next iter call will return null, right? So basically the verifier relies on this contract that eventually the loop is going to terminate. But what about loops that cannot be proven to be terminatable at, uh, uh, like during static analysis? What if you have uh, like a linked list where you cannot prove uh, acyclicity? So in this case, uh, if we have the support to cancel a program, we can actually uh, have loops which seemingly for the verifier run for an infinite, uh, like it's, it's basically an infinite loop. But uh, you could cancel the program after a certain time limit or a certain uh, like bound on the verif uh, on the program's execution, and the runtime cleanup would ensure that you leave the kernel in a consistent state and you return control back to the kernel. So, uh, if the verifier cannot st uh, like statically reason about uh, a loop's termination, then the ones that it con considers infinite, it will reject the program and basically say that uh, the the program will never terminate. In such a case, if we have cancellation semantics, it would allow us to express a lot of things like, that we cannot do right, right now, like uh, iteration logic for data structures, which the BPF runtime does not manage, like not BPF managed linked lists, but uh, like uh, linked lists managed by the program itself. And uh, possibly even have spin loops inside the program so that you can implement your own spin locks uh, in, inside BPF itself. Uh, so like j just as an example here, so suppose that uh, this linked list is built out of array map nodes. Now I think like this for a lot of people working with BPF, this is a well-known trick where you basically use the array map as a heap and build data structures out of it. So uh, in this case, uh, we have a linked list. Uh, uh, so let's ignore all the uh, like bounds check on uh, the element uh, access, but uh, for simplicity. And in this case, we don't really have any guarantee of acyclicity, right? So let's ignore what uh, the IE zero to BPF map, ma max loops is doing. Let's assume it's a it's a, it's an infinite loop. 
and then inside this uh, uh, inside this loop you have this uh, part where there are some kernel resources on the stack inside the loop iteration right so this area marked red would be uh, the thing that we would want to clean up if if we find the program counter in this range so bpf max loops is uh, quite a big limit like it's 8 million uh, uh, iterations if i'm not wrong and depending on what you do inside the loop it can run for like 20 milliseconds or mo even more than that, like depends on what you do inside the loop. So it's already in some sense allowing you to run the loop for a long time. So instead of that, like we would rather can cancel this loop if we figure out that it's stuck and based on our uh, latency requirements of the program's execution bound, we don't really want to run the program anymore. So recently we have added these three primitives right uh, bpf object new which basically hands over kernel memory to the program and <clears throat> uh, bpf link uh, link lists which uh, basically allow you to allocate nodes add them to a link list which is managed uh, through kernel helpers sim similar for arbitraries uh, <clears throat> uh, the reason that the verifier gets entangled with the implementation of link lists and arbitraries we had to teach the verifier about ownership about synchronization and everything is because this memory is managed by the kernel. It's memory coming from kmalloc. And this in turn forces the verifier to reason about how this memory will be released. In turn, it forces the verifier to reason about how this memory is being used. If it's, to, if it's stored in a link list or an arbitrary, we need to enforce that uh, the invariants of the link list and arbitrary are maintained. And eventually, like we are able to recover the memory stored in these link lists and arbitraries and hand them back uh, back to the kernel. Then we need to teach the verifier about shared ownership and unique ownership if a node is accessible from multiple uh, CPUs. And this also is a bit restrictive and reasoning about the semantics is not really easy. Instead, we could remove all of these, uh, uh, like all of these complex semantics from the verifier. Uh, by basically building on much lower level primitives. If you had a way to write express loops that the verifier cannot reason about, and it can still terminate them, you could build synchronization primitives. You don't really need BPS spin log. You could probably build a spin log that probably has NUMA awareness right into your BPF program. You could build your own data structures and iteration logic, because like once you have a loop that you can use to iterate over a data structure, you can basically uh, implement uh, find uh, operations, search operations for a data structure. And all of the memory uh, uh, that we manage in this way uh, should ideally not come from the kernel allocator, but some program specific heap. So some kind of an array map, but the problem is that the array map locks up memory. So we would want something more dynamic that allows you to request memory and release memory on demand. So based on this stuff, what have I tried so far? So I have tried spin locks with multiple levels. So right now in the verifier, we have this spin locks where you can only take one at a time. So in this case, we can have something like uh, lock spin lock A, lock spin lock B. And uh, uh, the, the, the way it uh, prevents a deadlock is, uh, once you have a deadlock, you have a bound on the loop that you are uh, uh, using to spin for the spin log, right? So once there is a deadlock, all, all, all of the waiters are waiting for the lock to be released, but nobody is making progress. So eventually, the owner or wh whoever is not making progress will be aborted, will be canceled, and that in turn ends up canceling all of the other waiters that are waiting for the lock. So you have this built-in deadlock avoidance uh, in, in some fashion. And then data structures, basically using uh, uh, this stuff uh, and using a share, uh, like shared heap of the program, uh, like an error map or something like that, you can build out all kinds of data structures uh, using these primitives. So you can have hash maps where you iterate, them, iterate over them, do locking, uh, link lists, arbitrary skip lists, and even the QP try that was uh, sent to the list uh, some time ago. And uh, exceptions through the cancellation semantics would underpin the safety argument for all of these. Like, they would allow enforcing the safety, the termination pro uh, property without really compromising the safety of the kernel and the program. And you would uh, use maps as the uh, as your memory allocator and basically unburden unburden the verifier from reasoning about all of the concurrency, synchronize, uh, synchronization, lifetimes, and memory management uh, semantics that we currently do. And basically only enforce uh, uh, memory safety uh, kernel uh, like termination guarantees uh, and like just get rid of everything else uh, 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 in that sense. And uh, this would also allow you to compose higher level verification frameworks with the current verifier. In some sense, 
you could write a program that's in uh, B the BPF front end of uh, the Rust front end of BPF, and it could uh, uh, restrict you in doing things in a certain fashion. But the underlying verifier doesn't really care about all that. It just cares about that you eventually uh, like uh, get, uh, get rid of uh, like ho hogging on the CPU and uh, not violate the memory safety constraints. So with that, I'll take questions. You mentioned adding so kind of bounds at runtime. Would there mm -hmm. be some way of observing them so that you don't run oh. into issues where you know everything's working fine up mm -hmm. until you reach that bound, all of a sudden everything breaks? Right. So, uh, so, so right now this is like uh, just uh, the experiments that I've been doing personally. Uh, so uh, what I do is uh, basically teach the verifier that this is a user space pointer that is uh, a pointer coming from a map, right? And this is the type, so the verifier knows that whenever you access this, it emits a bound check for you, right? That's right, I meant kind of the runtime mm -hmm. bounds. When you're talking about, for example, like loop durations. Okay. Because so right now you have the nice property, at least that when your program is loaded and you pass the verifier, mm -hmm. then at runtime it always kind of works. Whereas mm -hmm. here you could get to this point where you're right, you're very close to the bound or the maximum you know, amount of time you're allowing. Yes. And then you suddenly ah, pass I see. that I see. without I see. knowing. I see. Yeah. So yeah. So this is this is basically a trade-off that you have to make. So you need so 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 basically this is the worst case bound of your program. So this case should not be hit, right? But it's it's basically a way when when there is a bug in your program, or suppose if you have a cyclic linked list which shouldn't be possible at runtime, you basically are still able to recover and uh, basically the program should uh, stop executing and let the kernel continue. So this is basically a worst case recovery mechanism. In the ideal case, your program would uh, just continue executing normally like it should. Yeah. My yeah. point was it'd be nice to be able to monitor that perhaps so that if you're accidentally getting close to the limit in production, mm -hmm. then you'd know ahead of time before. Uh, so, so like you could you could choose to do whatever you want. Like, uh, like uh, one of the policy decision decisions is that you cancel the program, but like uh, you would choose your own limit or like uh, wherever you, wherever this limit is enforced, like you could also make it conf configurable to a different BPF program, which basically decides what to do uh, when when it encounters this condition at runtime. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Uh, can I talk more about this, uh, how to protect uh, for memory safety? Because I think what's your plan and what you have done? Because I think it's important for mm -hmm. many tracing programs that so they can directly access kernel memory, but there's mm -hmm. no guarantee on the memory. It could be, you could follow a pointer, but the mm -hmm. object may already be freed. That's more dangerous. Yeah. yeah. So, so do you mean like the pointer? What, what's your plan and what you have done in that direction? So, 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 uh, uh, with respect to the pointers that you manage using your own heap, uh, you're talking about that, or you're talking about I'm the talking point about, for, for example, you access in some kernel, kernel memory, uh, mm -hmm. kernel variable. You follow the pointer. Let's say so, so that is way. already there, right? The pointer to BTFID with the probe and semantics. Basically, like it, uh, it does exception handling for you at runtime. If you follow a bad pointer, and if it if there's a page fault, the kernel like already has this support where it basically marks the destination as zero. So if you have, like, because like it can allow you to read stuff, but it cannot cannot allow you to write stuff from tracing programs. So you already have this support where you can follow pointer chains, and then basically, uh, like you can even follow invalid pointers. All it does is it will have an exception like exception at page fault at runtime, and it will fix up the access for you. So what if the memory is already being, like, say, freed or just uh, not? Yeah, so, so basically it's uh, in the page fault handler. Like, once it hits the page fault handler, so, it just... So you say kernel already handles that natively. So you don't yes, have right. It. it happens right now, like, for tracing programs, yeah. And then what do you, what do you say about this memory safety issue you using exception? So, so if, if in the case, if you have this program-owned heaps, right, to, like, allocate stuff from and use exceptions to manage it, so in that case, you need stronger guarantees. Like if because you will also be writing to it, right? You will not just be reading from it. For reads, we can have this exception handling stuff. For but for writes, we re really need to ensure that you're in that memory bound in that memory region. So we need runtime checks. But there are ways to basically optimize that out so that you pay very little cost to do that. Uh, that memory is allocated from the at a runtime by the program. Uh, no. So that that's the whole point. Like you don't really want to use the BPF object new BPF. Uh, like uh, the memory allocator. 
okay. you want your own separate map which uh, basically allows you to chunk up objects from it instead of uh, letting the kernel do it okay yeah And um, hi, so um, th thanks for the talk. Uh, it's really interesting. Um, so I see that now we have the ability to sort of do a stack on when and resource cleanup mm -hmm. and, you know, on, upon an exception. Mm -hmm. So um, I wonder, if, is it hard to sort of extend this also to like normal, normal execution paths? So basically doing resource auto cleanup. Inside the kernel? Um, well, not really. Yeah, I guess inside the kernel. Um, so so that the programmer don't need to manually unlock. In that or case, whatever. we'll have to write the kernel in PPF, I guess. So, but yeah, but it's it's hard to do inside the kernel because in this case we st uh, like rely on the verifiers static analysis to understand what resources to uh, leave. Maybe the verifier could work for a certain portion of kernel code which does something similar. But yeah, like right now, I, it's 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 hard. It's very hard to do. I see. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, two quick questions. Like for the frame descriptors, don't you always need them when you also have tail calls because you don't know whether BPF throw is being called? Yes. If you if you call BPF throw, then you need to have them ready at runtime. Basically, you need to pay some cost in terms of memory uh, so that you can, whenever a throw does happen in the worst case, you know how to unwind the program. So you need them available. But it's like it only it, they are only generated for the cases where you actually call throw. So for only those program counters. And a lot of the times, like the state of the program does not really change much. Like you can have the program executing, but the objects allocated on the stack remain the same. Or there's like duplicate spills uh, of the same acquired object. So in some sense, there are ways to optimize that out. And basically, uh, like reduce the uh, memory over it further. Okay, and for the for the cancellation, I mean, one thing that was uh, mentioned earlier regarding monitoring, right? I mean, like I, like the one worry is that you 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 might leave the program at like an undefined state, right? Yes. Like if you change something in the maps and suddenly you cancel everything, right? It's mm -hmm. probably really hard to debug in production. Yeah. So so this is about. this is where like uh, being able to support uh, like having callbacks per frame would be really useful, so that you can do some kind of recovery code. Uh, before the program really ends up unwinding completely. And in that case, we wouldn't really allow these kinds of loops because you don't want recursion, right? You don't want that loop to end up throwing again and then uh, you go to the landing pad, then you do a loop throw again, like it's an endless loop basically. So it's like a more restricted uh, landing pad where you can do some recovery of the program and then you keep unwinding. Yeah, so you would need to combine it with something like that. Thank you. Thanks.